On the program, Health Canada gives the go-ahead to another vaccine. We'll look at the approval of the AstraZeneca vaccine, what it means in Canada's fight against the pandemic. An infectious disease expert will explain the pros and cons of this particular vaccine. And our journalist panel will be in to look at the changing politics of the vaccine rollout so far. A Quebec court has given the government one month, one more month to pass its new legislation on medical assistance in dying. Our MPs will weigh in on where they stand on the latest version of the bill. But we start with the Prime Minister announcing the boost that the arrival of the AstraZeneca vaccine will give Canada's vaccine rollout effort. Here's the bottom line. With Pfizer, Moderna and now AstraZeneca, Canada will get to more than six and a half million doses by the end of March. And there will be tens of millions more doses to come between April and June. The Prime Minister speaking on Friday in Ottawa. Canada has an outstanding order for 20 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine and is expecting an additional 2 million doses as well from India. Joining me now is Dr. Isaac Bogash. He is an infectious disease specialist and he joins us from Toronto. Dr. Bogash, thanks for taking the time. My pleasure. Uh, let's start with uh, this AstraZeneca approval. Um, obviously, it's going to bring more doses of vaccine to Canada, but where do you see it fitting in? It's a very versatile vaccine. You don't require that same minus 20 or minus 80 storage that the uh, Moderna or Pfizer vaccines require. It only requires conventional refrigeration. So you can really get this vaccine anywhere you want. This is something you could deliver or administer at, for example, a primary care clinic with ease, at a, at a pharmacy with ease. Of course, you could still use it at mass vaccine sites, but I think we're going to probably see more of the Pfizer vaccine delivered at those locations. And, and you know, the Moderna's and the AstraZeneca's administered more at primary care and pharmacies. Now, you've heard and, and we all hear uh, talk about efficacy and, and there, there are numbers attributed to, uh, to Moderna and Pfizer in the mid-90 efficacies. Uh, here, we're being told by Health Canada today that they as evaluate uh, AstraZeneca's efficacy at about 62%. What does that mean? Yeah, so I, we, it's not entirely a fair comparison because at the time the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines were being tested, there wasn't a, a tremendous degree of the circulating variants of concern and that was more of an issue during when the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine was being tested. Having said that, I think we can't ignore that the uh, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines have tremendous efficacy. We also have to look a bit further under the hood. And, and when you scratch the surface, you, you can recognize that, you know, obviously we want to prevent infection. But of course, you also want to prevent severe infection, hospitalization and death. And when you look at the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine, I mean, it really, really works well in preventing people from getting sick from this virus and requiring hospitalization and, of course, succumbing to this illness. So there's a lot of good that this vaccine can do. There has been some discussion about older populations, and Health Canada says that they didn't get clinical data about its efficacy and its use in older populations, or they didn't get a lot. Uh, France, for example, didn't, d d is not using uh, this AstraZeneca in older populations, over 65. Uh, what should we know about that? Yeah, so when you look at the clinical studies where they were evaluating AstraZeneca, there, it's not that they didn't have efficacy data. It's just that there weren't that many people in the older age cohorts that were enrolled in the study. So it's so I think we have to you know, certainly appreciate that. However, while France is saying they're not going to give it to people over the age of 65, they're reserving other vaccines for that population. Have, most other countries are using it for those populations over the age of 65. The European Union has recommended that it be used for 18 and up. And in fact, there's real world data demonstrating that those who get the vaccine, forget the clinical trials, real world data actually coming out of Scotland, demonstrating that there's a major, major reduction, significant reduction in hospitalizations, deaths, and you know, severe illness in anyone who gets the AstraZeneca vaccine of all age groups. Okay, I want to ask you another issue, and that is we're getting more vaccines. They're ramping up. Vaccine hesitancy. We heard an interesting report, I, I think it's a worrisome report, in, in Ontario, only 58% of staff workers and PSWs in long-term care homes have availed themselves of a vaccine, have gotten vaccinated after two months of intensive campaign in long-term care homes. Uh, what do you make of that? How concerned should we be and what needs to be done? So there's definitely lower vaccine uptake in particular groups. And of course, this is one group. I think we can look at this a couple of different ways. Of course, number one, yeah, we have to do better. We want to get that vaccine uh, uptake higher. 
Number two, the vaccine uptake of residents in those homes is is 90 percent plus, depending on the home. So the actual residents are protected. But of course, we still want the personal support care workers to be protected as well. And number three, and this is kind of the biggie, is look at the vaccine uptake for influenza vaccinations among healthcare workers. It's actually about 40 to 45 percent. So the fact that there's about 58 percent of personal support uh, workers who are taking up the vaccine, it's not enough, but it's a lot better than what we see year after year with influenza vaccines. Still have to improve. Still have to do better, but that's a significant improvement on influenza vaccination rates. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I heard you say that about nine months ago when you mentioned healthcare workers as a whole, frontline healthcare workers with a very low percentage rate. Um, but what about risk factors? Um, I mean, full disclosure, I'm a essential caregiver to someone, a father in a long term care home. Uh, the essential caregivers, family members, and professionals are almost 100% take up in the vaccines. As you mentioned, almost every resident who has can has gotten vaccinated, but when the workers dealing with them are only 58% getting vaccinated, is there a risk or are you counting on everyone else being vaccinated? Oh, it certainly adds additional risk. It, it certainly does. It just doesn't add as much risk as it would be if, for example, essential caregivers weren't vaccinated or if there was poor vaccine uptake among members of the home. We have to remember at the end of the day, who gets sick and dies from this infection? It's predominantly an older population. It's predominantly those who are age 60 years and up. And of course, we know in the residents of long term care are the frailest of the frail. Sadly, that's the vast majority of deaths that we've seen in the country. And the main goal first was to protect those individuals. And we did. I mean, it took a little longer than many would have liked. But ultimately, I think if we look from coast to coast, just about anyone in a long term care facility uh, who wanted to be vaccinated is now vaccinated. And uh, and, and that that's the that's that's the clear priority. Of course, we have to improve vaccination in personal support workers that we, we, we certainly do. It will add incremental levels of safety. I'm saying the 58 percent is not acceptable. It's not as bad as it could be. But of course, it could be better. And, and what it means is we have to work with these communities that are having low vaccine uptake. We have to listen to them. We have to listen to what their concerns are. We have to take it seriously. We have to address this because if only if we take it seriously, answer the questions and approach us with a view, with, with an empathetic view, uh, will we be able to get better vaccination rates in them? I guess, I mean, the question that we're not asking, and that is, should there be some sort of employment condition uh, in the healthcare sector, frontline healthcare workers? Should that be a condition of going into work? Um, I know it's a thorny question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're probably going to get a lot of different answers from here. I can just talk to it from a purely healthcare and public health standpoint, yes, yes, it would certainly help. Now, you have to talk about an individual choice and your rights and an and, and individual rights standpoint. People would say, no, I want the choice. But sometimes you can make that distinction and say, OK, you can choose not to get the vaccine. But if you choose not to get the vaccine, you have to wear you know, a particular mask whenever you're at work. And if some, some hospitals in, in some jurisdictions have done something like that. You see that in the United States some, from time to time. Maybe we'll start to see that in Canadian settings as well. Okay, Dr. Isaac Bogash, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for checking in with us. My pleasure. Have a great day. The Trudeau government has now, now has one more month to pass its legislative changes expanding access to medical assistance in dying. The Quebec Superior Court yesterday granted a fourth, and it says last extension. MPs in the House of Commons now have to vote on the final changes proposed by the government. The main change is that people applying for assistance no longer have to be facing a foreseeable death. That change, of course, was imposed by the Quebec court ruling, which found the previous law unconstitutional. The government has also accepted and modified an amendment from the Senate that would allow the mentally ill in Canada to have access to medical assistance in dying, but only in two years' time. The legislative package has to be voted on and sent back to the Senate. Joining me now are three MPs from the different parties. Arif Arani is a parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Justice. Michael Cooper is a conservative justice critic. And Alistair McGregor is the NDP's deputy critic, deputy justice critic. All three of you, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Good to be here. Okay, Ar Arif Arani, let's start with you on behalf of the government. The House is only sitting two weeks next month. So that gives you two, two weeks in which to pass this motion with these changes to the legislation. Do you have uh, support from another party, another opposition party, which you will need to pass this legislation? 
Well, we've actually got widespread support for this legislation, and I think it's unfortunate that it's come to this, to be frank. I think your viewers should understand that uh, we believe in debate. We believe that this is a complex matter. It's a personal matter. It's a moral matter. What we don't believe in is is uh, is, is is obstruction, and that's exactly what we're seeing by the Conservative Party of Canada. On three different occasions in the last about week to 10 days, we have offered extended sittings, weekend sittings on this bill so that we can actually have that debate that is so sorely needed. And that has been turned down by the Conservative Party, notwithstanding the fact that their justice critic offered up the exact same thing to a local newspaper in his riding in New Brunswick. So we want to work collaboratively. We've got wide support from the Bloc Québécois, the NDP and the Greens on this bill and proceeding to address people who are intolerably suffering. And unfortunately, we're dealing with obstruction on the part of the Conservatives. And each of the last two court extensions have been purely based on the fact that they have been preventing us from steering this through Parliament. Okay, Michael Cooper, um, reference there to Mr. Varani, referring to at least on at least one occasion last week. Uh, this week, uh, there was an offer to extend the sittings of the House of the sitting of the House of Commons to pass these changes. Uh, are you going to, as is being asserted, continue to try to block any vote on this on this package? We're not blocking any vote. The government sat on its hands for five days after uh, the Senate amendments came back to the House. The government uh, before that uh, had a good idea of what those Senate amendments uh, might be. The government controls its legislative agenda. They could have brought the bill up on Wednesday. They didn't. They could have brought the bill up today. They have not. And so the, the suggestion that we're the responsible for the delay is absurd. But uh, what's important to note is that uh, the government, in accepting a radical Senate amendment to allow persons who are suffering solely from mental illness to qualify for medical assistance in dying, is a substantive change that is light years apart from the Trushan decision. And so what we have is a completely different piece of legislation that the government wants to ram through without any debate, without any study, that will have significant ramifications for some of the most vulnerable persons in Canadian society. Okay, but, a question, but the question is, though, in terms of just sheerly technicalities, so you have two weeks left, you'll, uh, you'll be away next week, but back one week, and then away another week, and then back two weeks of sitting. Are you in a position to allow that full debate to be finished in the next two weeks, or will you find ways of, of delaying it and, and having it not finished? We, we want a fulsome debate, and frankly, we want a fulsome study. There needs to be a national dialogue uh, before even considering uh, the issue of mental illness. The government would not have found itself in this mess if the government had simply Pat, is, introduced legislation that responded to the Trushan decision. But that's not what they did. They introduced legislation that went well beyond the scope of Trushan, and now they've come back with an 11th hour Senate amendment that completely changes the bill. Okay, Alistair McGregor, uh, your party, can you support this legislation? Uh, Arif Arani referred to widespread support from the NDP in addition to the Bloc Québécois. Can the NDP support this, I mean, with the major change being that in two years' time, people suffering from mental illness will be able to apply for medical assistance in dying. That, all, of course, after some further study. Can you support it? Well, it's important to note that we're not here relitigating Bill C-7. Uh, Bill C-7 was passed by the House, and New Democrats did give their support at its third reading. However, uh, we cannot support the government's motion on this because, as Michael pointed out, it is a substantive change, uh, essentially sunsetting the clause that excludes mental health as an underlying provision. That is a, a huge expansion of the bill, and it's beyond what the House gave its approval of. So in answer to your question, New Democrats are not going to obstruct this bill, but we are not going to support the government's motion as it's currently worded because we don't believe that the Senate the unelected and unaccountable Senate should be driving the bus on this legislation. We believe that for such a substantive change, we need to have a fulsome review of this before we do the legislative change. So you cannot accept the motion and the package that's going to be sent to the Senate if the bloc supports we, it? Yeah, you're right. We cannot support the government's motion on the Senate amendments as it's currently written. Okay, Mr. Varani, I guess the question is, then, if you have the NDP saying they can't support it, the Conservatives sounding as if they can't support it because this, is, this particular change is a major one, uh, are you ready to uh, impose closure in one of those two weeks uh, in the next month? 
So, Martin, we have at all times on this bill uh, sought collaboration of the opposition parties and sought to give uh, fair hearing to all of the issues, both in committee and in debate. To purport that any delay is, is the fault of our party is absolutely incorrect, and I reject categorically what Mr. Cooper said at the outset. To give you a sense of how urgently opposition parties want to deal with this, the Bloc Québécois has offered up one of its opposition days to the Conservative Party so that debate can be continued on this matter. To purport that no na national dialogue has happened ignores the extensive consultations that took place when over 100,000 Canadians opined on this matter. The issue with respect to uh, the issue of, of uh, the mental illness review uh, is important, and I appreciate uh, Mr. McGregor's comments, but what is also important is for your viewers to understand what we are contemplating. We have always said that mental illness is a fraught area. We have always said we need to hear and have a conversation about mental illness. What we are proposing is that the 18 months that the Senate has suggested should be expanded to 24 right. months. So are you convinced and that you're going to get? So are you convinced that you're going to get support of the bloc and that this will pass? Then, if I could just finish on yeah. in the, within that 24 month period, you would have a task force of experts who would review that issue thoroughly, and then it would return to Parliament for an extensive debate. The bloc Québécois has already indicated that they are supportive of this matter, and for a party, and I'm pointing at the Conservatives here, that is presumably concerned about safeguards. I would reiterate for your viewers that if the 30 day deadline, which is the last extension, passes, there will be absolutely no safeguards whatsoever for vulnerable persons okay, in my, the province of Quebec. To, to my no question, 90 day assessments, no expertise, okay. etc. To my question, are you counting then on the support of the bloc and this passing? The, the bloc Quebecois support has already been okay. stated. Are, um, we invoking, are we seeking to invoke closure? We are not seeking to invoke closure, okay. nor have we ever sought to invoke closure on this matter. Michael Cooper, I know a lot of people who are opposed, as you are expressing, to further increasing access to medical assistance in dying. Some people are saying go to court. A lot of court watchers are saying that that is even more of a risk because a lot of court watchers say that any court challenge could lead to even further expanding access of uh, medical assistance in dying. What do you make of that? Well, that's possible. But uh, what we have right now is a government that is moving full steam ahead with radical changes to medical assistance in dying uh, without any appropriate due diligence. Uh, on mental illness, there is no consensus within uh, amongst medical professionals. There has been no parliamentary study and uh, the uh, me and mental health uh, people with mental health are going to be put at risk and the fact that the government is saying we're going to ram this through uh, in the face of that demonstrates this government's contempt for parliament demonstrates this government's contempt for evidence-based decision-making and demonstrates a callousness on the part of this government towards persons who are suffering from mental illness. Okay, it's just an that. absolute disgrace. On that note, we are out of time. Alistair McGregor, I want to apologize for running out of time on this, but I think we know where things will stand then. We will watch with great interest in the, next, uh, in the two weeks of uh, next month as we see the debate on this. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, to look at the latest in Canadian politics and on the COVID front, I'm joined now by Tonda McCharles. She's a parliamentary and national reporter for the Toronto Star here in Ottawa. And Laura Stone, who is a political reporter covering Ontario politics at Queen's Park for the Globe and Mail. Both of you, thanks for joining me. Hey Hello. Okay, let's start. Um, obviously, it's good news. Uh, the new approval of a new vaccine on the way, another 22 million doses at least starting in March. And Health Canada, mm -hmm. uh, the briefing also suggested that there will be approval soon for two other vaccines, Janssen and Novavax. Um, Tonda, what do you make of it all? Yay. <laughs> Yay is what I make of it all. Um, look, I, I, there's been a dearth of good news lately on the vaccine front, hasn't there? And I really find that, don't you, everybody is so negative about everything right now. And so this comes as a really great shot in the arm, just as we're seeing variants take off in different places and really lots of concern around numbers rising in places where we thought that, you know, some, some things were under control. But Look, Thunder Bay, for example, is having a terrible problem this week with COVID. There's an outbreak that spread from, from jails into shelters into the community. It's terrible. Uh, Newfoundland last week, the, you know, they have this uh, super spreader event and bang, 430 active cases in one week. I mean, it's terrifying. So, look, I say yay. Um, this was telegraphed earlier in the week, this approval of AstraZeneca. And, but it's really good news to hear that they're advancing on Johnson & Johnson and Novavax as well, because Canada has contracts with all of these. And boy, um, it's not just Ontario that needs vaccines 
coming in fast. Uh, it's all across the country. Okay, speaking, well, you set that up perfectly because speaking of Ontario, Laura, uh, in Toronto there, a lot of people have said that obviously the political dynamic is changing as we see this influx and this ramping up of vaccines coming in. Now people's expectations, their impatience, their focus is on provincial governments rolling out. We saw quite a scene in Toronto this week, uh, a lot of frustration. How, uh, how do you read what's going on there? Uh, that's right. Uh, you know, all eyes have been on Ottawa for the past couple of months. And now the focus is really turning to the provinces uh, who are in charge of distributing these vaccines. And then Ontario has the added complication of having 34 health public health units, which have come up with their own plans. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion and concern on the ground over how these vaccines are getting out, how people are going to register. We heard this week that Ontario's booking system is coming two weeks later than some other provinces like Ontario, uh, sorry, like um, Alberta and Quebec. So a lot of questions as to why Ontario wasn't ready earlier and um, and how we're going to reach those over 80s. And then there's the added factor of some local units such as Ottawa, which are coming up with their own plans and getting out there proactively to higher risk neighborhoods and getting shots out to people who are 80 and over before the province's booking system is really underway. So we know that um, that things are really going to ramp up in April, May and June. And I think that there's going to be a lot of pressure on the provinces uh, to clearly demonstrate to the public that they're ready, get the mm -hmm. word out and to get these vaccines going so that not a dose is wasted uh, and, and that we're getting these numbers much, much higher than what we've seen so far. Um, I'll, I'll throw something out there and it, it relates a bit to what Tonda said and that is that there's always, there's right now we're in an intense period of, of fatigue, of frustration, of impatience. And we saw that applied to the federal level. When are the vaccines going to be there? The political masters said, you know, patience, patience, it will solve itself. Could we be seeing the same thing in Ontario? For example, Rick Hillier, the man in charge of the Ontario rollout, said, look, you don't know our numbers. We've got a larger number of, you know, priority groups, and that's why our rollout, uh, our, our mass vaccination uh, line is not open, because we just don't have, we are giving a lot of shots out uh, to other priority groups. Uh, is, it, is there something that politicians are just going to have to argue for patience? There certainly is a growing frustration. Um, people want this to be over. They want measures to be eased. They don't want to talk about more lockdowns. I mean, in, in Toronto, Peel and North Bay, they haven't even left the stay at home orders from the province. They're not, they haven't even transitioned to lockdown, yeah. which is more permissive than, than the, what they're in right now. We know businesses are suffering. People are ready to get back. So um, there is a growing frustration, I think, uh, uh, among the public and uh, more accountability will be placed on the provinces and those who are in charge with the, the vaccine rollout here uh, to, to, to get it going. And, you know, we did hear from, from General Hillier this week uh, defending why the province has not, um, has not launched the booking system yet, saying that it's because of a lack of supply. But in the same breath, he also said that he, he had hoped that it would have been up earlier. So um, I think there are a lot of questions about why province, the province has not been as prepared as people have expected. Uh, Tonda, what do you make of the new political dynamic? I mean, it, it is a real change for, for the Trudeau government. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's interesting. The Conservatives have been hammering the government um, in the fall over rapid tests uh, and their lack of availability. Um, and then since December over their vaccine strategy. And to a certain extent, when the vaccine um, supplies, you know, crimped and, and, and stopped coming in in February, that was that was working for them because it was an expression of the frustration people felt. But I think that Laura's right that as the vaccine supplies um, ramp up, the, sh the, the focus does shift to the provincial governments. It takes some ammunition out of the Conservatives' hands to a certain extent. Um, but it's also interesting to me that, you know, the, the, the NDP has really been reluctant to be as hard on the government over the vaccine supply. I think genuinely they're very concerned about um, maintaining public confidence in not just the supply, but the integrity of the supply and the value and the efficiency and the efficacy of these vaccines. So they're, they've kind of sided with the government on the vaccine issue. But look, the NDP is also, as we've seen, um, this week, you know, said that basically they're they're kind of prepared to back the government because they just don't want an election in a pandemic. Um, so there's a lot of runway there for the government, I think, in the months ahead. And, uh, you know, we'll see how that all plays into to election timing, won't we? Mm -hmm. Well, you raised the point, and, uh, and Laura watching from Toronto, but you saw the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, 
basically categorically saying as clearly as he's ever said we are not going to allow the government to create or to cause uh, an election we won't vote for anything that will bring the government down there's never been such a categorical statement at least that i can can remember in the past few months uh what do you make of that well, I mean, that could be, in a sense, a reading of the public mood that uh, the public is just not uh, clamoring for an election right now or even in the next couple of months. And I think certainly for the Liberals, until uh, um, a, a majority of Canadians uh, or certainly older Canadians have had their shots, I don't see them wanting to go to the polls uh, where the predominant question at this time or in the next at least month or two would be about the vaccine rollout. I think it's interesting, though, that the NDP has kind of played its cards so early um, without kind of a build up to the budget or um, laying out clearly what their demands will be um, on things like National Pharma, Pharmacare program mm -hmm. and, and some of the pressure that they want to put on the government for some of their key priorities. I don't know if that they if they approach this as strategically as maybe they should have, even if they do not want an election, they probably could have. Uh, laid it out there a, a little more strategically heading into a, a big event like the spring budget. That, that is interesting. But, you know, I wonder. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say to Laura's point, I mean, I wonder actually to what extent um, uh, the NDP have already calculated that the Liberals just are not interested in working with them. I was speaking to Jagmeet Singh the other night and, um, you know, he's convinced that there's been no effort, real effort uh, to reach across the aisle by the Liberals since last fall when um, they made, you know, the opposition mm -hmm. motion on, you know, all the pandemic response, a confidence vote, that he's convinced that Trudeau's ready to go to an election this spring, soon as the budget's over, maybe soon as their policy convention is over in late April. Um, so, I think that they've already understood that the Liberals are not negotiating with them. I don't know that how much horse trading they saw in their future, um, but they have tried to lay claim to credit, political credit, for already forcing the Liberals to do better on wage subsidies, to do better on sick leave, to do better on a whole range of things in the response. I think that, I think that he may be right. I don't think that the Liberals are interested in horse trading or negotiating with them anymore. And mm -hmm. maybe with the numbers the way they are now, they wouldn't be afraid of going to an election. Mm -hmm. Except, of course, for the uh, prospects of something like Newfoundland happening, where you have a, exactly. a resurgence. Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, last word to you, Laura. Do you think, uh, do you think the, the Prime Minister is itching to get that election, but his circumstances are just not going to allow him? I honestly think it's possible, and I honestly think it's possible that it's kicked down the road. I think you cannot close the door to anything yeah. at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, if fall is a better time, I think that the Liberals would look to that. But if things ramp up significantly in the vaccines, uh, if, uh, you know, as Tonda said, if the numbers continue to look good for the Liberals, the Conservatives are struggling with uh, with their new leader and, and name recognition and coming out strong on the attack and trying to define Aaron O'Toole before he can define himself, he's introduced or reintroduced himself a number of times now yeah. to the public um, and we see liberals uh, release old videos of him for instance mm -hmm. um, you know I think the liberals mm -hmm. do think that they're in a strong position so they do hold most of the cards right now if the vaccines uh, continue to flow and if yeah. Canadians uh, um, opinions change about uh, the fortunes of this vaccine okay. rollout. Okay on that we'll have to wrap it up but uh, they certainly won't be getting any help from uh, Jagmeet Singh on that. Uh, listen both of you thank you very much for taking the time thanks for speaking with us. Thanks, Thank you. Martin. Have a good weekend, everybody. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. From all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching and have a great weekend.